So God accomplishes his will through my failings, through my troubles. God accomplishes his will despite my ignorance of the details. God is working through it all. This evening we're in Genesis chapter 37 verses 1 through 36, so covering the entirety of Genesis chapter 37. This evening what I want to talk to you about is how God is working. How God is working. Now, that may be somewhat of a, um, not a misleading title, but it doesn't exactly give the whole story, nor does it tell you everything that I'm going to be able to tell you. To be honest with you, there are some things that I can tell you about how God is working, but really the truth is that the secret things belong to God. There are many things about the way in which God is working, the details that he is working out in our lives that he does not share with us. And he is not obligated to share the details with us. We are obligated to trust him with the details. We're obligated to trust him with things that we cannot see. Is that not the definition of faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things that are unseen. And so we're called to trust in God, even with the, the minute details of our life, even with the difficult details of our lives. We're required to trust in God. We're called to trust in God when, when it seems like our dreams get shattered. You ever had a dream that got shattered? Something you, you thought about your life and the way that it would be and it doesn't come about that way. How, how easy is it to trust God in that moment when, when that dream seems to come unraveled or fall apart or at a minimum be, be at question and you just don't know if it'll ever come about? How God is working. Let me tell you this one truth tonight, just to summarize everything. I can tell you this, God is working through it all. God is working through it all. I can't tell you all the details. I don't know all the details and nor do you, but I do know that he's working. I do know that God has his sovereign hand in all things. Hebrews chapter one tells me that even Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Meaning if he, if he pulled his word back for just a moment, that the very universe would crumble. That it's not gravitational pull that's keeping us grounded here on this earth. It's the word of God that's making that happen. God is working through it all. I'm going to walk through this passage, I believe, as it was intended. It's meant to be seen as an entire narrative. You, you are meant to see the, in, the entire introduction here of Joseph into the land of Egypt. We wrapped up last week looking at the generations of the Toledot of Esau. You saw those who were descended from him and where he ended up residing. He ended up residing there in the hill country of Seir, also known now or in those days as Edom. That Toledot essentially wrapped up the life of Esau. So it says there in verse 1, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings. Not like Esau. Esau moved out of the land of his father's sojournings. But God, being faithful to his promises, has brought Jacob back in to the land of his father's sojournings, and he lives there. He sets up what you would think to be permanent resident. It says that he's in his father's, the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. And then in verse 2, it says, these are the generations of Jacob. These are the Toledoth. The, these are the names, the descendants, the line that preceded out of Jacob. This is Jacob's lineage. The book of Genesis is actually built, the name Genesis is the, the Greek translation of that Hebrew word, Toledot. 
toledot means generations. It means beginnings or descendants. There are, in effect, there are 10 toledot sections in the book of Genesis. That's the way the entire book is organized. We've been walking through Genesis for quite some time now, haven't we? And we have actually just now, entering into chapter 37, we have just come across the final toledot section in the book of Genesis. What this section does for us is it opens, it opens for us the narrative of Jacob and his family coming into the land of Egypt where they will reside for 400 years. The descendants of Jacob will live in the land of Egypt for 400 years. They will live there for the majority of that time as slaves living in the land of Goshen. But how did they get there? How did the people of Israel get there? Think about the original audience that would have received the book of Genesis. It would have been the Israelites who had just been delivered out of the land of Egypt. And we would have to remember that they must have been asking the questions, how did we get here? How did we get to the point where our people, they have not always lived in the land of Egypt. How did we actually come to be brought to this land? And that's what this Toledot section explains for us. Chapter 37, all the way through the end of the book, chapter 50, and that section actually goes rather quickly. These 36 verses, what we're gonna do is divide them up into two main sections. Two main sections, if you're taking notes. Verses one through 11, you're gonna see Joseph the dreamer. Joseph the dreamer, and then quite a stark change of circumstances in verse 12 through 36, you see Joseph the slave. He actually transitions in this text, in this one chapter, from a dreamer, the favored of all the sons of Jacob, to a slave. Joseph the dreamer, verses 1 through 11. There at the end of this sermon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw for you Two principles, two principles about how God accomplishes his sovereign will. I think that's what we're supposed to understand, that that God is working out details in Jacob's life and Joseph's life to bring about salvation for the people of Israel. Look with me there at verses 1 through 11, Joseph the dreamer. It says in verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. Remember what that was like? Some of it, it's hard to remember back that far. Some are looking forward to being 17. You remember what it was like to be 17 though? I I remember, I, I, I suppose I do. I'm getting more and more of a grasp of it about how immature how um, naive, how naive I, I actually was about how the world worked. Joseph was 17 years old, and he was, it says in verse 2, he was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Billa and Zilpah were the maidservants of Leah and Rachel. Billah and Zilpah, Billah had born Dan and Naphtali, and Zilpah bore Gad and Asher. So four of the chieftains of Israel, four of the sons of Israel were born to these two women. And Joseph was growing up with them, spending a lot of time with them, but he was not so much welcomed in their number, not after these events anyway. It says in the second part of verse two, and Joseph bought a, brought a bad report of them to their father. He has just found his way out of the circle, hasn't he? He has, he has displayed what? It depends on your perspective, doesn't it? In, in, in our perspective, maybe we look at this and we say, well, Joseph has demonstrated his honesty. Joseph, Joseph is an honest man. What must his brothers be thinking? What a snitch. That, I guarantee you that is exactly what they were thinking. What a tattletale. What a snitch. We, we can't do anything around him. 
So you know what? We can't include him in anything. He has just found his way outside of our fellowship, outside of our friendship, though he is a brother. He, bought a, he brought a bad report, a report of their evils. It's literally what it says. And he brought this bad report of them to their father. Now, it says in verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors, a robe of many faces, or a robe of, of many hands. The Greek Septuagint translates that as a robe of many colors, of many ornaments. And why does Jacob give Joseph this coat of many colors? It says because he favors him. He is the son of his old age. Joseph is the 11th born son of Jacob. And he is the son of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel. And so Jacob loves Joseph. That love for Joseph is probably only rivaled with Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. Benjamin had just been born just a few chapters back, just a few years back, as Jacob had just entered back into the land of Canaan after his sojourn in Padan Aram. You remember Rachel had been barren. The last child she bore before coming into Israel was Joseph, Joseph being a young man. They come into the land of Israel. They go down from Shechem, and they're in Bethlehem or near the Tower of Eder, the shepherd's tower, and Rachel gives birth to a son. And the son's name is Benjamin. She says, Ben Oni is his name, son of my hardship, son of my mourning, because she's dying. And she dies in that childbirth. So Joseph not only is the son of, of Jacob's beloved wife, he's the son of his old age, he is also one of the last remembrances that Jacob actually has of the son of his love. So he gives Jacob or Joseph a coat of many colors. Joseph is favored. You see, well, from your perspective, Joseph is honest. He's a man of integrity. Joseph is a favored man. From his brother's perspective, again, Joseph's a snitch. And Joseph's spoiled. That's what he is. He's not favored. He's spoiled. He gets everything he wants. Daddy dotes on him. He babies him. He coddles him. This has got to be very frustrating. You would think that Jacob would have learned that, that showing favoritism in a family is never healthy. You recall the way Jacob grew up. Jacob's brother being Esau. Esau was the favored son of Isaac. Jacob was not the favored son of Isaac. Isaac loved to eat the game that Esau would hunt. You can read about this in Genesis 25. But Jacob was the favored son of his mother, Rebekah. And so this sibling rivalry is kindled even there, and it's, it's kept aflame in the home by their parents' passions. This favoritism is given over here to Joseph too. Look at verse 4. It says, But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. If you can't say anything kind, don't say anything at all. Either they were very silent or they were very ugly. But it wasn't any mixture of kindness in there towards Joseph. He's a snitch. He's spoiled. They hate him. I think it's important for us to check our hearts right here, lest we be guilty of this same kind of hate, looking at people who, who walk in honesty, people who walk in integrity, people who may be a bit more favored than us and looking at them with, with anything less than love. I want to remind us of what our Lord and Savior taught us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 22. 
Jesus says, you have heard that it was said of those, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. It's not right for us to say, well, that's just for other people. We're redeemed. Jesus is saying this to his disciples. We ought to love one another. Now, look at verse 5 through 11. He's honest. He's favored. And look at this. Joseph is prophetic. Now, Joseph had a dream. He, he dreamed a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. That's actually striking when you read that, when you read that in the Hebrew, they hated him even more. It literally says they added even more hate to him. They added even more hate to him. Joseph's name in Hebrew is Yosef or Yosef. In Hebrew, his name means add to. You remember that Rachel names him Yosef because she says, may God add to me another son. It seems like the names that these children bear are actually prophetic. Sometimes the names are more prophetic than was assumed at first. Because now it says that he was hated even more. They added even more hate to him. It actually uses his name here as a verb, that they Josephed more hate upon him. They hated him while Yosipu added more and more of their malice to it because he dreamed a dream. Now listen to the content of the dream, verse 6. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more. They added even more hatred on him for his dreams and for his words. They not only despised the content of the dream, they despised the way in which he said it to them. It seems that Joseph is quite unaware as to how these dreams might make his brothers feel. He thinks that his brothers are going to be excited about this. Maybe he has failed to remember that he brought a bad report of them to the father. And now he's going to go to them and tell them of how, how God is actually going to make all of them bow down to him. So he, he, he tells them a dream. It's just an agricultural dream. Here are these sheaves of wheat all around Joseph and those sheaves of wheat representing all of his brothers, and there's one sheave of wheat that remains standing in the end. All the rest bow down. Very simple to understand. In fact, they needed no interpretation. The brothers knew exactly what this dream meant. So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Let's talk a little bit about hatred here. Reminds you of what John wrote for us in 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. He writes, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In the eyes of God, hatred for another person is the same thing as murder. Murder with the heart and murder with the hands are equivalent in the judgments of God. And you'll see quite often that murder with the hands is almost always preceded by murder in the heart. Joseph's brothers have already slain him in their soul. He's already dead to them. They don't care if he lives or dies. In fact, they prefer if he dies. 
and yet they haven't lifted a hand against him just yet. Now look again there at verse 9. In verse 9, he tells us another dream. It says, then he dreamed, verse 9, another dream and told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. Now, later on, what you'll see is this. If, if you think back, I'm not going to go through the litany of dreams that have already been recorded in the book of Genesis, but every dream that has been recorded in the book of Genesis up to this point has come from where? It's come from God. Every dream in the book of Genesis up to this point has come from God. What we are to assume when we read this text, though the, the prophetic nature of Joseph's dreams has yet to be fulfilled, they will be fulfilled. But even though they have yet to be fulfilled, I believe that we are to assume that these dreams are from God. In fact, later on when Joseph is in Egypt and he is interpreting dreams for Pharaoh, Pharaoh has two dreams. The, the dreams of Joseph, the dreams of Pharaoh, they always come in pairs. And Joseph actually gives us commentary and explains that when these dreams come in twos, that it is confirmation that God has fixed the thing. That's what he says. That whatever has happened in this dream, because it has been dreamed twice, that God has permanently fixed this. This is his will of decree. This is the will that will be accomplished. So J Joseph has another dream. Look at verse, verse 9. It says, Behold, I, dream, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. His daddy didn't even like the way he was telling the dream. His daddy didn't like the content of the dream. The thought of a father bowing before their son is a reversal of the created order. And this bothers Jacob. But it says that, that Joseph's brothers, they're jealous of him. They hate him. But what does it say of Jacob there at the very end of verse 11? It says that he kept these things in mind. That reminds me of a phrase. It's used elsewhere. It's used in Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, after the angels appear to the shepherds who are out in the field, you remember the, the shepherds are singing in the heavens, the heavenly host, and they tell the, the shepherds to go and they'll find the baby there in Bethlehem. And so the shepherds go, they find Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and they begin to, to tell Mary and Joseph and all those around to tell them everything that these angels have said. And you know what it says of Mary in Luke chapter 2, verse 19? It says that Mary stored all of these things up in her heart. She's perplexed by it, and yet there is a hint of faith. There, there's a, a mustard seed of faith. Store these things up in their heart. Is this from God? I believe Jacob is exhibiting faith here. Joseph is honest. Joseph is favored. Joseph is prophetic. I don't think his brothers looked at Joseph as though he were prophetic. The way I think that Joseph's brothers looked at him, not only was he a snitch and spoiled, he's smug. He's arrogant. Here he is telling us that we're going to bow before him. Here he is going and telling our father that our father is going to bow before him. Who does this kid, this 17-year-old, think that he is this dreamer? That's what Joseph is, though. Joseph is a dreamer. The proof will be in the pudding. The proof will be in the fact that these dreams will be validated. Later on in Genesis chapter 41, you will see his brothers bow before him. Not once. They'll bow before him twice. And then for the remainder of their life, Joseph will indeed rule as governor over them. Not one 
word of God's good promises have ever fallen to the ground. Now, Joseph's a dreamer in these first 11 verses. Look at verses 12 through 36, though. Joseph's not so much a dreamer here, it doesn't seem. Joseph is a slave. Look at verse 12 through 17. Joseph is sent to his brothers. You remember what happened last time? The last time he was sent to his brothers, he came back with a bad report. So it says in verse 12, now his brothers, Joseph's brothers, went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, 30 miles north of Jerusalem, that is. And Israel, that is Jacob, said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said, here I am. So he said to him, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. And a man, get this, and a man found him wandering in the fields. That verb for wandering actually elsewhere can be, can be construed or translated as found him walking about confusedly. Here's Joseph, 17-year-old. He's walk, he thinks his brothers are in Shechem. He has no map in his hands, it doesn't seem. There's no way to get in touch with these guys. And he shows up in Shechem, and he's just wandering around in people's yards. Here, here is a man, just a man shows up. Now, it's going to be interesting. There are some commentators who actually assert that this man could have been an angel sent to help Joseph. It's quite fascinating that the one man that finds Joseph wandering around in the fields is the one man that overheard Joseph's brothers saying where they were going to go. Just a coincidence, I'm sure. Or maybe it's just the providence of God. Maybe that's what we're supposed to see in the entire text is that God is providentially guiding the steps of Joseph. So this man finds him wandering in the fields. And the man, verse 15, asked him, what are you seeking? Verse 16, I am seeking my brothers. And he said, tell me please where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now, that's an interesting travel decision that they've made. They told their father that they would be in Shechem. That's where everyone thought that they would be. But they've actually left there and gone to Dothan. They have traveled 20 miles north on foot with all of these flocks, 20 miles to the north in northern Israel to Dothan. Their father has no idea where they're at. Joseph had no idea where they're at. There was one man, it seemed, in all of Shechem that knew where these brothers were. Lo and behold, it's the man who finds Joseph wandering around confusedly there in a field. So Joseph gets sent to his brothers. Now look at verse 18. Joseph gets shoved in a pit. Verse 18 says, they saw him from afar. They could have seen that coat of many colors from a mile away, couldn't they? What was seemingly a blessing to Joseph actually marked him out to his enemies as a target. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Verse 19, they said to one another, here comes this dreamer, Baal Helom. Here comes the Lord of dreams. The title that they give to Joseph here is quite sarcastic, isn't it? Here is the God of dreams, blessing us with his presence, that smug prophet. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Verse 20, come now. Interesting enough, in the Hebrew, normally the way that a Hebrew sentence is structured, the verb is in the first position in the sentence. The verb is right there at the beginning of the sentence. But here, there is, a, there is a particle, there's an adverb that's at the beginning. And it says, now. Now, come. It's, it's flagged to, to tell us that they are hurrying about their business. They want to get this done. They see this as an opportunity. 
Sin has already conceived in their heart, as James would say, and it is giving birth to death. So they say, come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. What is their intention in throwing him into the pit? Their their intention after killing him and throwing him into the pit is to undermine the dreams that God has given him. They would rather see their brother dead than their knees bow before him. They're willing to kill him to subvert the will of God. Interestingly enough, you'll see how that turns out. Look at verse 21. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness But do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Reuben is the eldest son of Jacob. He's the eldest of the 12 sons of Jacob. He is the firstborn son to Leah, the unloved wife of Jacob. Reuben, if you recall, Reuben is the one who slept with his father's concubine. Jacob heard of it. Maybe Reuben feels sorry for what he did. Maybe Reuben feels shame for what he did, and and he thinks, I can't do anything else that's shameful to my father. I've got to protect my younger brother. Don't lay a hand on him that he might rescue him from out of their hand or restore him to his father. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Lest we think that there was a chance that Joseph was going to drown. Lest we think that there was a chance that his brothers were going to murder him. Reuben stands in. The one who has shown some of the least amount of moral fortitude and courage, he's the one that steps in to do the right thing. And then they throw him into a pit, and lo and behold, This cistern that's meant to hold water, it's dry. God is providentially providing for Joseph this entire time. Look at verse 25 through 28. Not only is Joseph sent to his brothers, shoved into a pit, now he gets sold into slavery. Verse 25 through 28. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, lo and behold, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Exactly where the Lord wants Joseph to go, lo and behold, there are Ishmaelites, descendants from the son of the slave woman of of Abraham. Abraham has a child with the maidservant of his wife, Her name is Hagar. This is the son who does not have promise attached to him. Ishmael is kicked out of the home. He's sent off to the east. And where do these Ishmaelites come from? These Ishmaelites, they come from the east because that's where the land of Gilead is. It's to the east of the Jordan, just south of the Sea of Galilee. It says in verse 26, Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. How noble, Judah. You don't want to kill him because you're brother, but you're okay with selling him. Why? Because your thirst for blood is only surpassed by your greed for money. So so now, not only has God preserved Joseph's life by one of the least moral of his sons, Reuben, and a dried up cistern, now he allows greed and covetousness to well up in the heart of Judah. And Judah says, I know what we'll do. We'll sell him. There's something far more profitable than just killing our brother here. Let's sell him. 
Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, verse 27. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listen to him. The Midianite traders, I thought, I thought it said Ishmaelite a minute ago. These are interchangeable, lest you get confused here. I was a bit confused when I was studying it. These are interchangeable names here. The Ishmaelites, the Midianites, apparently they had intermarried and become one people. To say Ishmaelite means that they're somehow related to the outcast son of Abraham. And to be a Midianite was to be a bit more of a specific region of Ishmaelites. Then, verse 28, Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit. I don't know if Joseph was looking at his salvation or not. They drew him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Joseph is sold for the common price of a common slave. Some commentators say that 20 shekels of silver was the price of a slave according to the code of Hammurabi. Look at verse 29 down through the end. Joseph is supposedly dead, sold into Egypt, but supposedly dead. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the blood, dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. It seems that the sins of the father return on him through his sons. You remember that Jacob's name means supplanter. Jacob has this name not only by birth, but by his character in his previous life. Jacob is the one who deceived his father when his father was most least suspecting. And now Jacob is the one who's deceived by his own sons when he is least suspecting. Verse 33, and he identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. He swallows this lie, hook, line, and sinker. Verse 34, then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son's son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. You know, it doesn't actually tell us until Genesis chapter 41 when, when Jacob hears that Joseph is alive in Genesis 41, it tells us that at that point, Jacob's spirit was revived within him. You know how many years passed between this passage and Genesis 41? 22 years, Jacob lived under the false reality that his son had been killed by a wild animal. 22 years, he wept at night for his son that he had supposed was dead because he had been lied to. But look at verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Joseph is sold not to an ordinary man. He is sold to a man of extraordinary position and access to Pharaoh. It's in Potiphar's home that Joseph will prove his mettle only to be found in Pharaoh's prison. But we'll get to that in the coming weeks. You know, I, when I read through this passage and study it, I can't help but, but understand that Genesis 37 is meant to be seen in light of everything that God did for the people of Israel in using Joseph to save the Israelites from death during that famine. But I have to go back to the moment when Joseph is thrown into the pit when, when Joseph is drawn up out of the pit, when he's carried off, he's having to travel all the way through from north to south through the land of Canaan, through the land of promise, only to arrive at Egypt and to find himself on the slavery trading block. And I have to wonder what this 17-year-old bloodied up must have been thinking in those days. I think we all understand what it's like to have dreams get crushed. What what it's like to actually think that our life will go a certain way 
and then have to wrestle in the moment where our life changes directions and wrestle with whether or not we will trust the love of God, whether or not we will trust the wisdom of God, or whether we will doubt his love or doubt his wisdom. There was a movie, I'm sure many of you have seen it. They took the novel, turned it into a play, and then a movie. A movie called Les Miserables. There's a character in Les Miserables, her name is Fontaine. Fontaine is a quite a, a tragic character. She seems to have so much promise, she gets a job. She gets sacked from that job, she loses the job, and then she has to hand her child over to somebody else because she can't afford to take care of her child, and then she subjects herself unwillingly to prostitution. And she sings probably what is the most moving song in the entire movie. Let me read for you just the last few lines of her song. But some dreams just weren't meant to be. I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living. So different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. When we think that our life is supposed to turn out a certain way, and it invariably doesn't, do we, do we sing that song? I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living. So different now than it seemed. Life has killed the dream I dreamed. I'm sure Joseph was tempted to think that way, but I don't think Joseph ever gave in to those temptations. I think that Joseph trusted in the sovereignty of God. I know this, that whether or not Joseph trusted in the sovereignty of God, God didn't quit being sovereign over his life. God never stopped working. And you might think, well, well maybe God stepped in and started working when, when, when God saw that Joseph's brothers hated him. Or, or maybe it's just this. Maybe God allowed a 17-year-old in his naivete to present these prophetic dreams in such a smug way so as to allow his brothers to hate him. And, and to allow his brothers to be welled up with hate and send him to Egypt. God carefully manicuring the process the entire way to take Joseph to Egypt. How else is he going to get him there? That's where God needed his man to be for the salvation of the children of Israel. And to get him to the place of saving the people of Israel, it meant taking him through the path of suffering. Let me tell you the first principle about how God accomplishes his will. God is sovereignly accomplishing his will even through our failings and troubles. God is sovereignly accomplishing his will even through our failings and troubles. I did not write that he is accomplishing his will despite our failings and troubles. And many times we might, we might think that we have a failure, we have a trouble, we go through a difficulty, and we say, God, intervene, as though he is not already there. When the reality is, is he is always working. God is working through it all. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. It doesn't say that God reacts to all things according to the counsel of his will. It's that he works all things according to the counsel of his will. I want to remind you of one of the greatest promises that we hold on to is the fact that God is sovereign over our lives, even in troubles. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know 
that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called, who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God is working through these things. He's working them together. That word in the Greek talks about a symphony of events, all of them playing different notes, but all part of the same song of life. Here's the irony. Joseph identifies it for us. Joseph sees clearly the hand of God. Maybe he didn't see it in the moment, but he sees it at the end. Genesis chapter 45, verse 5, he tells his brothers, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve your life. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. God is sovereignly accomplishing his will through our failings and troubles. When your dreams seem to get shattered, understand it may have caught you off guard, it may have changed your plans, but it is the plan of God. And he is wise, and he is good, and he is working his will out to perfection. It has never missed a beat. Even when we don't know the tune. It's never missed a beat. Principle number two. God is sovereignly accomplishing his will despite our ignorance of the details. God is sovereignly accomplishing his will despite our ignorance of the details, amen? I don't like that one though. I I want God to tell me. God, tell me what your plan is. Tell me what tomorrow holds and he doesn't do it. God isn't interested in me knowing. God is interested in me trusting. God sovereignly accomplishing his will despite our ignorance of the details. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. You want to know the will of God? That's what Deuteronomy 29, 29 says. You want to know the will of God? Here it is. This is all of the will of God he has promised to reveal to you in this life. Trust this. Leave the secret things to God. Now, just one point of application here. Never judge the plan of God as evil or unwise. When your life doesn't turn out the way that you had planned, don't judge that as God being evil. And don't judge that as God being unwise. Even the most unsuspected events in our lives are ordained sovereignly by El Shaddai, Almighty God, who's working all things according to the counsel of his perfect will. So don't judge the plan of God as evil or unwise. Let me remind you, Isaiah 40, 13 through 14, who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? That that question is left open-ended because nobody has taught the Lord a thing. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's almost as though God tells us in his word, I would tell you the details of my plan, but you can't handle it. You wouldn't know what to do with these details. They are beyond you. No mind has conceived the plans of God. Just trust him and watch it unfold. I'm saying that to me. I hope you hear it, but I'm saying that to me. 
So God accomplishes his will through my failings, through my troubles. God accomplishes his will despite my ignorance of the details. God is working through it all. If you need one confirmation of this truth, I would tell you, don't even look to Joseph. If you need one confirmation of this truth, look to Jesus. Let me remind you of the way the apostle Peter preached Jesus on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. God was working out his plan of redemption through his son, Jesus. Not despite the failings of the Jews, not despite the failings of the Romans, but through it. He was using that to bring about the greatest good that could ever be accomplished, the redemption of sinful people by grace, through faith, for all who put their trust in Jesus. No one on earth knew the plans of God to do that. In fact, Jesus told his disciples multiple times, the son of man must be betrayed, handed over to the hands of lawless men, crucified and raised again on the third day. And not one time did they understand what he was saying. It never entered into their mind that God would send his son to die for the sins of the world. Never entered into their mind. But you know what? God didn't need them to understand in order to accomplish it. He still did it. God is working through it all. Child of God, take comfort in that. You don't have to know all the details, and you can trust him through the difficulties. God is working through it all. Would you pray with me?